Welcome, Closers. We are live here with today's webinar on how to build a lead nurturing program. Last time we talked about the why, the overall purpose and reasoning behind building it. Today we're going to talk about the how, which is the next step. So a couple of housekeeping notes before we get started. Co-host here, Alex Osinenko. Alex, thanks for joining me today. Hey, thanks, Jordan. Nice to be here. A couple of housekeeping notes. So I want to mention that you're definitely going to want to stay all the way through the webinar. At the end, we're going to be talking about a specific case study from four and a half, looking at some actual hard data that Alex was kind enough to uh, comb through. It wasn't easy to get, but to comb through this data, some really great hard, hard data of a case study from four and a half. Also, at the end, we will be doing a Q&A. If you have questions during this presentation at any time, you can ask questions. Feel free to ask questions in the chat. We, at the end, we will be taking questions from down below. So you can enter questions down below at the very bottom in the Q&A section. We will take those at the end. This is part two in a three-part series. Last thing, Alex, before we jump in, I know that you had a couple of details to share with us about the PM Grow Summit, which I am super excited about. So what do you got for us? What's, what's the state of the union with the PM Grow Summit? What's what? Okay, PM Grow Summit is the conference for growth-minded property management entrepreneurs, business owners, and it's happening on, well, we have dates. It's a 99% confidence. We've been saying that for the last couple of weeks, but you know, we've final negotiations with the hotel. It is uh, January 25th to 27th of 2017 in West Palm Beach, Florida. It's going to be awesome. Um, we're including a lot of entertainment, food, and um, great speakers. Just, uh, I don't know, Jordan, do you want to tease out our our uh, keynote speaker budget, at least, not the person? Because we have the person almost signed. But Let, <laughs> let's, let's wait to share all those details until next week. We're, we're close. I mean, the bottom line is we've been working hard, been doing a lot of vetting, and we are really, really excited. There really just isn't anything like this out there. So it's going to be a really unique event. We're, we're super excited about it. Uh, that, is, that, that is true. So those are the uh, details. Alex, go, let's go ahead and dive in. If you want to go ahead and share your screen, we're going to go ahead and kick things off. So uh, folks, again, this is part two in a three-part series on lead nurturing. First, we did the why. Now we're doing the how. And part three is going to be the what. All of this should give you an end-to-end -end deep understanding of why lead nurturing matters, how to actually build out a program, and what it looks like specifically. So today, with the how, we're going to go ahead and dive right in. And by the way, we have Need to in the comments section. So if you have any questions, need to will be your go-to guy to answer those. All right. So um, this is the agenda for today. We are talking about the house. We're going to go ahead and move right on in. All right. All right. Let's keep moving here. So we did um, mention last week, just talking briefly about this concept of the golden circle. This is something that Simon Sinek talks about. And it's really a, an important concept in my business. I know it's something that Alex values as well. And the overall philosophy is basically in any key area of life, when you're trying to get the best results, you have to start primarily with an orientation of why. What is the why behind what we are doing? And then you move on to the how. Once we've got past that, core, we understand what that core reason is, we move on to the how, which is the high level strategy, and then the what, which is the tactical ex execution. Today, we are talking about the how. And specifically, we're going to go and be getting into um, the five-step nurturing game plan. So there are five steps and we're going to be breaking this out with individual sections. The first step is mapping the buyer journey. Second step is matching with an ideal experience. The third step is defining your nurture program. The fourth is automating your nurturing emails. And the fifth is measuring the impact. Alex, why don't you open us up here with section one, mapping the buyer journey. All right, let's jump right into it. This, um, this, Actually, you know, preparing for this presentation, I've learned a lot myself. And I was talking to Jordan as, you know, we spent days 
you know, reviewing and presenting and and looking through data. And um, this in this particular presentation really taught me a lot. And I'm hoping to convey some of these uh, value points to you. So let's start with you know identifying the buying stages. Uh, as a consumer, we go through fairly defined stages when we uh, you know when we talk about buying something or or um, hiring a service or employing a service. So you know it goes by like this: recognition, research, evaluation, purchase, and review. So let's go dive in each one, and I'll tell you quickly how it relates to your particular business. Um, the question is, what are the consumers, the customers, the landlords, the real estate investors are doing in each stage, and how can you influence that? Okay, um, in recognition stage, this is where somebody just kind of begins to be aware that they have a problem. For example, you know, as they're having breakfast, they're realizing that, hey, rent that for my rental property was late three times out of the last five months. Am I in trouble? Ah, this might be okay. So at this point, they're kind of aware that the problem might be there for them, or they're moving away from their property, and they're concerned that you know, uh, it, being an absentee landlord, you know, how their property is going to perform and things of that sort. At this point, they're cons they're passively consuming information. They're just paying a little bit more attention to information related to managing the property. Now, when things get a little bit more serious, um, they start doing a bit more googling right google is your best friend when it comes to knowledge so and, and and usually they will ask questions like this you know how to handle late rent you know in the middle of their lunch break or something like that or how long does the eviction take so they're starting to, to be a bit more serious about realizing that they do have a problem and they're trying to figure out if there's a solution out there recently i watched an episode of uh, the prophet it's the show with marcus limonis and he is Basically, is there to save people's businesses, and one of the episodes really stuck with me. It's is he was trying to help this business, and the landlord of the business was owed hundred and twenty thousand dollars because the tenant, the business, did not pay rent for three years. Okay, so that's that that's a unique stage, and I call that stage rage. Obviously, we're not gonna it's beyond the scope of this presentation, but. You know, you know, at research is where people begin to kind of realize that, hey, let's do something about it. Um, evaluation is further down the funnel. This is where, um, you know, this is where they they start doing a bit more deep, deeper digging, I would say, in, into the particular vendors and and how things are laid out. This will they read your reviews. And at this point, as a property manager, it's really hard to hide um, because their evaluation stage will happen without your participation and they will review options in their local town, whatever that may be. And they'll probably pay more attention to uh, better reviewed property management companies and they'll consume more information out of those websites. Um, because if you as a property management business does not have any uh, customer feedback published, it'll be hard for you to, um, you know, engage them in the next stage, which is which is purchase. You know, this is where folks are, um, you know, engaging with vendors, with prospective vendors. And if you have not participated in this in any of the previous stages, this one's going to be kind of hard, right? Uh, this one is going to be difficult if you're just another phone call for a quote. You know, might be all you know related on price. Their decision might be related on price. However, I have some good news. If you do have a solid sales process, you can still win the deal, even if you have not engaged them in any other steps before. You know, the purchase on is where your time to shine. And if the person that actually did the engage them does not have a solid sales process, you have a higher chance of winning the business. And lastly, the the review is where you know you have two options here. Either you have an incredible customer experience, you provide your owners with an incredible customer experience. And they will you know, become your brand ambassador, so to speak, where they're really happy. It's a breath of fresh air. Your service solved the problems. Or they become your detractor because they're not getting what they were promised. And they have buyer's remorse. And that start looking for other options. So those are kind of the, the, the five uh, uh, steps within the buyer journey. Now, let me actually um, – 
talk about a quick caveat here, and that is, you know, the marketers on the left think that the buyer's journey is linear. You know, it just goes down the funnel and goes stage to stage to stage. In reality, we're all over the place. You know, we get busy. You know, just think about yourself and you're looking to buy a car or when you're looking to do some major purchase or, or a major service. It takes it takes a while for you to make up your mind. And there's there's different things that that uh, um, uh, they're on the way. Um, bottom line is you none of us control the buying process. OK, uh, we don't control our customers buying process. But what we can do is put guideposts and specifically. I want to talk to you about the guideposts you can put to influence every step of the buyer's journey. And let's go back to the recognition. OK, so in recognition, if, if somebody just becomes aware that they might be having a problem, the way you can insert yourself in that step or the guidepost in that step is send them a mailer or maybe meet them at the networking group and talk about the property management do's and don'ts. Um, you know, at this point, the consumer might be paying attention to your radio ad if you got one going. So that's kind of the awareness step. The next is when they're ready to do a bit more research. This is where you can really influence them and put a really strong guiding post uh, by providing blogs, videos, and articles on specific how tos, you know, addressing the potential pain points of your customers. This is very few people do it, even less do it, do it, you know, um, put an a real true education uh, forth rather than the salesy content. And this is where you can really capture them in their buying journey with your video blogs and articles and such um, to make them aware that, hey, solutions exist and these problems happen. And there's actually a service that solves these problems, which is property management. Uh, the next stage is evaluation. Um, you know, at this point, they're beginning to kind of look at your reviews, checking you out a little bit. And now they've already consumed some of your content. This is where they will go and download an ebook on your website or um, they will uh, uh, sign up for your email list. It's a bit more of an engaged uh, step. And then finally, you know, going to purchase and review when they buy. You know, they'll speak to your BDM or business development manager. And if you, again, if you provided the guideposts along the journey, the, the selling process is a lot easier. And, of course, it's a lot easier to get them to turn them into, um, um, you know, a, a brand ambassador, somebody who can recommend your brand, recommend your company to friends uh, if you've participated throughout their journey. Um, couple, you, you know, one, one thing that is, you know, uh, like – a little common mistake in each section and and specifically this uh for this one is you know doing the same saying the same thing to everyone just does not actually can do the opposite of what you try to do um it just shows the lack of awareness and they're just really not caring on your side the business side and a consumer gets really discouraged if they begin to get you know canned information that is unrelated to their particular step in a journey in the buying process or their particular concern you'll just alienate them and uh, um, so stay away from that and and you know if you do it do it right well said yeah absolutely so there's nothing wrong with canned information as long as it is canned to meet the needs of the specific individuals that you're dealing with so now we're going to go ahead and transition over to doing a poll so you should be able to see down below at the bottom of the screen, there is a polls section. Click on that tab for polls and we're gonna answer poll number one. Poll number one is, do you currently have any content offers on your website where people can access content by providing their email address? So this is a this is just a basic exchange here. Somebody is giving their email address, they're getting some content. Do you currently have an offer like that on your website? I got a couple of votes. Coming in here. 50-50 at this point. All right. 50-50. All right. So we'll call it a day at 50-50. So we, we got basically a toss-up here. Some people uh, some people answered yes. Some people the answer is no. Kind of a mixed bag. The next question is, what are the specific types of offers? How are they positioned? And how effective are they at actually converting? But we'll get into that in the next section. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen and take us on to section number two, here we go. All right, so section number two is where we're gonna be talking 
about um, about meeting those buyer stages with the appropriate follow-up action items. So we basically want to say, these are the buyer stages. This is what the, the process that people go through in the process of buying from you. How can we match that with the appropriate types of experiences that people want? And this right here is fundamentally the goal. This is what success looks like. When we're meeting those buyer stages, we're combining your unique value and expertise the right timing of where that individual is at, what they're looking for, as well as their specific interest and needs. So timing, interest, as well as your unique value brand experience. When all those things come together, that's when we experience success. The problem is most companies focus here. This is what 99% of companies in the market do, which is basically just talking about yourself, your services, your pricing, your offering, me, 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 we, 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 we. You don't want to we, we on top of prospects. That's not going to end up well. What we want to do instead is to combine these because without the right timing and without properly addressing individual customers' needs, your information about yourself is completely irrelevant. But if you have these, if you combine these elements, this is where we do the slam dunk of education. And so let's talk about the specific types of content that allow us to do this. When we talk about combining, tying all this together and doing the types of lead nurturing we're talking about, really content is kind of the meat and potatoes of, of what we're do, using to accomplish this. And so when we talk about types of different content, we're talking about early stage, middle stage, and late stage. What does that mean? Early stage is higher up in the buying funnel. People are not committed. They're doing research. Your goal is just to get eyeballs. Middle stage is where there is some level of engagement, but people are trying to understand what criteria they should use to make a buying decision. Late stage is when people are committed to buying and they're evaluating specific vendors and they want vendor specific information. So, Typically, what we recommend is that for early stage content, it should be ungated, meaning people should be able to get access to it without having to give up their email address. Middle stage content should be gated. This is a deeper level of interest, and this is where people's motivation should be enough for them to be willing to exchange an email address for high quality information. And then at the last stage, late stage, this is also ungated because this, this is basically sales collateral, and anybody... Anybody that wants to read about your company, your services, and your pricing, you should absolutely allow them to do so and not provide any impediments from that. So in the list here, we talk a little bit about the specific types of content. But let's just actually give some specific types of examples of early, middle, and late stage content. So this would be early. This is an ebook uh, put out by Bigger Pockets. Shout out to Joshua Dorkin. And this ebook specifically is the ultimate beginner's guide to real estate investing. You can imagine this is just broadly applicable to both folks that even don't even own a home, maybe a, a existing homeowner to somebody that owns a couple of rental properties, maybe an accidental uh, investor, broadly available, broadly interesting content. So it's early top of stage, get as many people in the funnel as possible. Once they're in the funnel, now we're drawing them down a little bit further. And this is directed towards the person that is, is really seriously considering about hiring a property manager, but they don't really know what to look for. They haven't done this before. So now we give them a guide to be able to evaluate the different property managers they may come into contact with. This is pure gold for somebody that has maybe gotten a couple of different quotes, but they're still just kind of unsure as to what, what are the right questions to ask, et cetera. And then finally, an example of late stage content. This is an actual pitch deck. So this is put out by Renner's Warehouse. And if you meet with Renner's Warehouse in person, you're going to get a copy of this specific pitch deck that they offer to each and every lead that they meet with. This is high quality sales collateral. That's why it belongs at the bottom of the sales funnel. So here's a major caveat that I wanna give about everything I have just said. When we're talking about meeting the buyer's needs with your custom tailored process, you have to recognize that you have different audiences and that's obvious. I know you're aware of the fact that you're going to deal with an accidental landlord, maybe hopefully some institutional investors and people that are somewhere in between. So 
the, the assumption, the kind of the implicit assumption with everything we've talked about up to this point is that you only have one audience, but that's not true. You have multiple audiences. And so to accommodate that, we have to make sure that we're keeping in mind what do these individual audiences need to hear? What are their specific questions that they have? And then offering content that is custom tailored to each of those individual audiences. Some people in marketing speak will call this personas. Persona is a great way to do it. This is a uh, this is a great idea, and this is an advanced level tactic. You do not have to keep in mind separate audiences starting out. If you have a one size fits all lead nurturing program, that's a great place to start. Over time, additional segmentation is what you should be striving to graduate towards. So when we talk about matching the ideal experience, the most common mistake that we see in this section is talking at people instead of to them. And this basically just goes back to wanting to talk about yourself, what you do, what you offer, why you're the best, how you're number one, your awards, et cetera, as opposed to actually recognizing that your primary orientation should be around what the consumer wants, what the consumer needs, and then spoon feeding them that content. Step number three in the five step process is defining your nurturing program. Uh, and before I move on here, Alex, anything you want to add on the previous section about matching the ideal experience? I'll tie it into the data that we've collected on a case study to kind of really uh, uh, show what the results may look like. And um, towards the end, as I present my little case study, uh, but no, so far, it, it no, so far is really good, really good. Awesome. So we'll keep moving here. Talk about defining the nurture program. We've already talked about mapping the buyer journey, meeting that mapping with an ideal consumer experience. Now we're going to talk about actually defining this program. And there's some basic elements that constitute a lead nurturing program. If we look at these specific criteria, these are basically what we're talking about. You have to have a defined objective, entry and exit criteria, touch points and key messages, you have to have frequency and timing nailed down, and you have to understand what kinds of assets are required to get the job done. So let's start up at the top, a defined objective. You have to have a reason and a purpose for having a lead nurturing program. I know that sounds obvious, but a lot of people look at marketing automation as basically a panacea or a one size uh, fits all kind of cure to the problem of lack of marketing results. But you have to really get granular both in general and then at the macro and the micro level of what you are trying to accomplish overall with your lead nurturing program and then with each constituent part. So that could be for each defined audience, for each email, you have to have clear objectives of what you're trying to accomplish. Secondarily, you have to have entry and exit criteria. Well, what does this mean? This basically means you have to understand under what circumstances you are going to feed people into your funnel. For example, you go to a networking event, somebody hands you a business card. Do you take that and then enter that person on a drip campaign? No, you shouldn't because you don't have permission to email that person. It's possible that somebody gave you a business card and under other circumstances, you somehow gained explicit permission. But in general, that wouldn't be a good example. A good example would be somebody downloaded an ebook off of your site and now you're going to drop them into a sequence of follow up pertaining to, the to whatever content was in the ebook that they downloaded. Um, on the backside, exit criteria. So a common mistake that we see is emailing cold dead lists that have basically been flogged to death and have had either a lot of bounces or no kind of a response in the form of an open or a click through in a very, very long time. We don't want to do that. It's going to hurt your deliverability. So you need to have clear criteria for when you're going to take somebody out of your active list, when you're basically going to scrub them. It sounds counterintuitive, but it's a really important best practice. Let's talk about the touch points and key messages. Moving from left to right, these are the types of campaigns that we're talking about you actually building out and sending out to your audience. Starting on the far left, we're talking about a welcome campaign. So this is basically where you have a new subscriber and you have a sequence that specifically introduces your company, introduces your company culture, welcomes this person, starts things off on the right foot by leaning in with some of your best content. That's the welcome sequence. Past that, we have an education sequence. This is kind of when we really uh, get cranked up with the ongoing types of content. And we're going to start with that top of funnel content. So this is going to be more educational, more broadly appealing. 
and we're going to allow people to self-qualify. And when I say self-qualify, what I mean is we're going to allow people to either engage or not engage with that high value, broadly applicable content. And if they engage with it, if they click on it, if they open it, if they go to your website, now they're raising their hand and saying, hey, I'm interested. I want more let me deeper in the funnel. And that's when we would move on to a why us type campaign where we're talking about um, the overall kind of fit between problem and solution. So their specific problem is that they either have a bad tenant in their unit or they're lying, they're looking to uh, get into real estate investing. They're looking to get more out of their portfolio. And we're going to match that with how your specific offering addresses those problems. So this is where we would bring in some testimonials, uh, case studies, some behind the scenes kind of stuff about what is different about your specific company. Next campaign would be a close campaign. So this is now where we're actually in a situation where we're in the formal sales process. And I want to make very clear here that the vast majority of companies that we deal with, they ignore the first three steps and they start on step number three. And really, they don't, a lot of most folks don't have any kind of lead nurturing program, period. But they start on step number, step number four, forgive me, which is close. Really, the close should already be a situation where you've had a lot of interaction and you've created a lot of value prior to that point. So you're dealing with the warm prospect. But regardless, once you're in that close stage where you're actually having a formalized sales conversation with a qualified lead, this is where we begin a, a separate campaign where we're sending out services information. We're doing a pre-appointment demo video and a post of cap along with testimonials. So basically at every waypoint during the actual sales process, we want to use lead nurturing to actually buttress and support that sales process. So the emails that are going out here are very distinct from those individualized transactional one-to-one -one emails that are sent out by a salesperson. These are marketing emails that make that salesperson's job easier and accelerate the sales process. The Fifth campaign is a onboarding campaign. So you signed the contract, you've got the deal done. And now we are actually going to actually make sure that this person has a fantastic onboarding experience. We're going to make sure that we give them that wow factor. This could be anything from offering them a small gift where the dollar value is irrelevant, but the fact that you cared enough to actually acknowledge them and offer a gift means everything in the world. We wanna set expectations. We wanna give them a clear understanding of what's happening now that they are a client. The worst thing that can happen is to land a client and now to have them feel lost or neglected after you've signed the contract. That's kind of beginning, that, that's, that's beginning the process of apathy that eventually leads towards churn. And lastly, a retain campaign. This relates to overall customer engagement, trying to understand are people happy, surface unhappy customers to be able to nip that in the bud and deal with it early on, and also hopefully solicit reviews and referrals. So these are six broad categories. And in the next webinar, we're going to actually, in, in part three, the what, we're going to show specific examples in each of these categories. But broadly, these are six types of of uh, campaigns that different messaging will fit into. Alex, any any um, thing to add here? Yeah, thank you for the prompt. So, uh, brilliant. I mean, this is brilliant. But I, I I just want everybody to know that neither myself, a marketing company, nor Jordan, the sales CRM guru, are anywhere near uh, <laughs> anywhere near uh, perfection level on all of these programs. Now we both are good at certain things. Like I think four and a half is really, you know, focusing on educate, um, not as much as why us and some of the retention, but even you're talking about the top notch fortune 500 companies. And I'm like, I'm considering the portfolio as one of the, you know, really good marketing, you know, companies that have really good marketing. They don't have all these points checked, but what's important is to understand that this is what the success looks like. And let me give you a quick story, which is just really, to me, it kind of solidifies this drive to success rather than the success itself as a as an you know as an end to the means to the end. So, uh, one of my heroes, Gary Vaynerchuk, Gary V, you know he's he's a media mogul and and he, his whole goal in life, like he wants to own the Jets, right? The New York Jets, the football team, is all about that. And when people ask him, like, what you know, what how, you know, are you close? He goes, no, it doesn't matter. It's the journey that matters. Like, I have this goal, this almost unachievable goal at the end that but the journey is what matters so i guess what i'm to to, to bring it back 
you know, if you have only one thing and you're doing it right, from there you can iterate and improve. And this is this is you know this is a lot to do. But if you really want to be a, a, a good you know growing fast growing one of the top businesses in the world, you have to strive to this. This is perfection defined. Well said. Well said. It's absolutely a work in progress. Anywhere you can start is where you should start. Build out from there over time. All right. So let's go ahead and keep moving. Um, talking about frequency and timing. Frequency and timing is essential. You have to be thoughtful about when these emails go out, what the cadence is. In general, you can kind of look at what's on the screen here. These are some good overall guidelines. But I just want to give you a broad general rule, and that is the further that you get from the initial point of contact, the more that you need to be mindful about making sure that your frequency and timing is driven based on engagement and that you're focused on delivering value. One of the things that we see happening is when an initial sales inquiry comes in, after that sales inquiry happens, whatever the timing and frequency is for the first 14 days, some folks are still doing six months out. And the reality is when you had an active sales conversation going on within that first couple of weeks, there was much more justification for you reaching out more aggressively. Six months from now, you should not be emailing somebody once a week and asking them if they're ready to follow up with you. So in general, we want to keep keep um, make sure that the timing is in sync with what the expectations and the engagement level we've had is. Lastly, we want to talk about assets required. So in order to do this, in order to pull off, Alex made a great point. Start wherever you can, but wherever you're starting at, you're going to have to have these things. You need to have a landing page or somewhere to host an offer or a form. You need to have content assets, whether that's an ebook, email copy, and you all and the email copy, of course, is hugely important. Making sure that it's well drafted, it's well written, it's dialed in. I hate seeing spelling mistakes in sales errors. If you can't spell properly, what are the odds are? If you can't take the time because everybody can spell properly. But if you can't take the time to use spell check in the 21st century before you send out a professional sales email, what does that say about your overall service? So this is the big picture of what we are trying to accomplish. We're trying to nurture people all the way through the funnel, top to bottom, from the beginning of the buying process all the way to the end. At each one of those phases, our goal is to nurture them to the next step, nurture to the next step, nurture to the next step. If they get to the purchase phase, we've had a sales conversation and it goes sideways, that's okay. Because if you have a lead nurturing program in place, you get a second chance. You get the opportunity to redeem and recycle that lead upstream back into the prospect category, send out more interesting content keep nurturing, keep maintaining the relationship, and you get to be patient enough to wait until they're ready to have that follow-up sales conversation and jump back into the active buying process. If you don't have a lead nurturing program and you don't close them, that's it. Too bad. You're never going to see them again. And lastly, when you get them to that post-purchase review phase where they're asking themselves, hey, am I happy? Was this worthwhile? Did the expectations they set at the outset get delivered now that I'm a customer? It's at that phase that we are nurturing for a positive review. We're nurturing for a customer loyalty and we're nurturing for that referral. If you have a robust lead nurturing in pr process in place, you should be consistently generating referrals, not out of one-off asking and trying to be mindful when you're dealing with the customer, making it haphazard, but systematically generating referrals off of systematically happy clients. So, with step three in the five-step series, the most common mistake that we see in trying to define a nurture program is that there is no program. There's just a couple of disparate elements. And I see this all the time. Here's a great example. Somebody attends one of these webinars, they hear what we're talking about, and they think, oh, you know what? Hey, I need an ebook. And so they come up with an ebook, and it's actually a good ebook. And then they place that, that ebook on their website. On the very bottom, of their website on some backwards page that nobody can find and the form is like broken. Well, that doesn't really accomplish anything. Or it could be that you have a couple of um, well done emails, but the timing on them is terrible. So you have to have 
each of these elements tied together before you actually have a lead nurturing program. It's very much possible to have a three-legged chair, which really isn't going to do anybody any good. Yeah, technically, you can find a way to sit on a three-legged chair, but build the fourth leg. On to the next step, which is automating your nurture emails. This is the magic, and this is what most people are interested in. When we talk about market automation, most people are interested in the automation. They want a turnkey experience. People just want to see it uh, run. So let's talk about how that actually happens. So you may remember this story if you att attended part one of this three-part series on lead nurturing, where we talked about a major professional failure that I had earlier in my career with a business where we created amazing, amazing content that generated hundreds of thousands of views, but ultimately was a failure because we were failing to capture emails and nurture those emails off of this content. So there was a giant loss associated with it. There's a link in the bottom afterwards. If you're looking at the slides, you can go back and view the entire story. But what did we do next? When I started my next business, the very first thing I did was I created another piece of amazing content. But what did I do with that content? I funneled people to drop their email address. And as soon as they dropped their email address, I began this patent pending uh, crazy secret sauce process of delivering value on a frequent, early, and often basis. So this is basically a sales course with drip emails that go out over a series of weeks. And this is what it looks like. When you actually sign up, this is what this is the one of the first emails that goes out, basically giving you a little preview of the content with a link to read the rest of the article on the website. Spend a lot of time on the content, but what's really important is making sure that the emails are engaging enough to pull people towards it, that they're experiencing real value. And this is what the sequence looks like overall. I believe there's 10 emails in this specific sequence for the sales course. Um, and you can see that the timing is set up so that these emails are going out on weekdays, not on the weekend. There's about a week delay between most of the emails. And so th that's, that's absolutely essential. You have to have your timing and your sequencing correct, making sure that it's going out. You know, you don't have your, a key email going out on Christmas Day. But that's that's really, that's the very beginning. If, when we really want to take it to the point where we're going to get maximal value, we want to use more advanced, what we call segmentation and sending logic. And so let me give you an example of that. Here is a email in the sequence that does not always go out. This specific email, which is basically an ebook on a information about lead response time, that's an ebook specifically about that. We use some more specific criteria here. So this is the, this back here is email number four. Well, email number three was talking about why speed matters in sales and why follow up, following up quickly is really really important. If you read that email and if you actually engaged with that email. Then we're going to send you this follow-up ebook because it's related to the previous email. So the point here is we're using some conditional logic, and I've created this in MailChimp. And right now, the point isn't to get really into the weeds about conditional logic. We're going to talk about that more on the part three, which is going to go more into the weeds when we're talking about what. But you get the basic idea. Uh, so let me give you another example. Email number 10 in this sequence is what we would call a sales email. So after you've gone through the entire course, you've got all this value that we've laid out and created. Now I want to send you a soft follow-up of, hey, I saw you recently com completed the Lead Simple Sales course, and I wanted to reach out to offer a personal tour and a 14-day free trial to Lead Simple Software. It's soft, but nonetheless, I'm segmenting it further. What if somebody signed up and they gave me their email address? They didn't read any of the emails. They didn't click on any of the links. Is it, is it a good idea? Is, is this going to be a, a good use of my energy to send out that email? Probably not. And so we're segmenting it further. For that specific sales-oriented email, we're segmenting based on engagement. In this case, MailChimp has a function called member rating, which is kind of an aggregate roll-up of engagement. And we're saying, if we have had meaningful engagement, then send out the sales-related email. If not, skip it because we know we're going to have other opportunities to nurture. So if we don't send out that sales related email, that doesn't mean I'm never going to email this person again. That just means I'm not going to send out this specific email at this specific point in time. 
So we're, we're going to get more in depth with the nuts and bolts of uh, setting up automation and triggers and stuff like that on part three, the next webinar. But what I want to say in summary about this is the most common mistake that we see with automation is that the email system is used like a meat cleaver or a baseball bat instead of a surgical tool. I frequently run into folks that are excited about automation, but the way that they're excited about doing it is just setting it up and having it run and having very little investment in how it works, what it does, just start sending the emails, crank it up, start sending the emails. And, and oftentimes this, this turns into a spam issue. Somebody says, hey, I bought this list from a realtor. I wanna, I wanna blast out all of these, I wanna blast out all this, th this list of a thousand realtors with my five, um, five reasons why you should start sending us referrals. Bad, 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 bad idea. And you're gonna get zero value from that. Alex, am I the only one? Have you, have you run into that kind of uh, attitude about automation? All the time. I fell on my face, uh, you know, originally, initially, when I was learning about how this whole thing works, you know, five, six years ago. And it is a very common practice. You know, it, it's it's just, um, you want to kind of dip your toe in the water and, and see, you know, what results you'll get before you invest any more money. And the easy, the easy uh, uh, way out or way in is, is yeah, just grab a list off, uh, you know, of an Excel list and drop it into your favorite mail provider and send them a salesy email and then proclaim that email marketing does not work because you get banned from that email service. <laughs> it happens all the time. No, it's quite normal. This is, this is that kind of a, remember that buying journey that you and I just, been yeah, about, right, 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 right. right. So typically the buyer journey for, for the email marketing for small business starts at that recognition. And once you get to research, you start making mistakes, which is fine. Because if you didn't make them, you would know what to do. The thing is, the thing is, just attend webinars like this and, and really get educated about this and do it as a surgical tool, not a cleaver. I like that analogy. I'm going to steal it. <laughs> well said. So let's move on to our second poll of the webinar. I'm going to go ahead and kill my screen share. Guys, down at the bottom, we do have another poll. So look at that tab. If you haven't answered it, please do so. Poll number two is how closely do you track your sales and marketing performance? Oh, interesting. Oh, okay, fine. We got, we, got, we got one honest person in the room. We got one honest person that said I make two honest people that said I make decisions mostly based on gut intuition and what's working and what's not. Guys, in, in all reality, most of us are in that bucket. Alex and I, we do marketing for a living. We care about it. We we expend a lot of effort to track this stuff, but we'll both be honest and tell you there are a lot of holes in our game in terms of the things you can and you cannot track. There's a lot of room for improvement. But most of our clients tend to be in a world of hurt in, in terms of actually having actual hard quantifiable um, data. But apparently of these attendees, we only have one person that is in that bucket. Well, two, two well, now. <laughs> well, so here's the deal. Well, first of all, people who attend webinars like this, Jordan, usually a bit more, you know, uh, uh, kind of uh, at least educated and concerned about this. A little more savvy. I, I, okay. can, allow, I can allow for some of that and uh, deviation, statistical deviation from the, you know, the masses, so to speak. But the second element is, you know, it's very hard as a small business, it's very hard to prioritize tracking, measuring, you know, uh, uh, and, and data digging, so to speak, uh, you know, to, to be able to make the right decisions. Um, it's really hard. But if you, again, it starts small and iterate, iterate, get better and better and better. And hey, you know, someday you'll be able to check yes all the way at the end. I can't. Uh, I'm still in the middle, if that. Fair enough. Fair enough. All right. Poll is completed. Final section is measuring impact. And I am super excited about this section because Alex, you have some really awesome data that you're going to be sharing with us. Let's go ahead and kick this off. Please do the honors. All right. Thanks, sir. So, um, you know, need to and I, and we got fan on it. Uh, fan is our data guy from the AdWords team. And we went on a data dig yesterday because Jordan says, Alex, Give me some good numbers, man. Let's 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 see. You do a lot of content. You're like the content marketing company, which yeah, I am. Um, and and let's see what the results are. So I we we went on like a deep dive data data dig. Took us like three hours to to compile the data, and we have some to share. But let's let me first kind of define this this uh, the measuring uh, the key KPI, so to speak, the key performance indicators. And again, if you have one that you know for your business, that's great. 
iterate and begin to kind of measure in more meaningful ways. But you know, the first one is offer conversion rate. Uh, the offer conversion rate is essentially. Let me get. To, 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 to. Is you know, if you have that ebook download, or if you have you know nine ways, nine reasons to hire a property manager, or nine reasons you might not need a property manager. If you have that ebook and it's downloadable on your website, you got to be able to figure out what is the conversion rate. How many people seen the offer versus how many people actually partake, participated in the offer and gave you the email address. So that's a useful metric. The next one is the open rate. I like this a lot. This is more of a, um, let's call it, um, some will say vanity metric because this is only tells us how many emails are being opened. Uh, but I'll tell you later why this is important. So you can track any email provider can show you the open rate. Like, hey, my open rate is 22%. That means on average, 22% of my uh, mail list subscribers open my emails or this particular email. The next one is the click-through rate. This is more important of a metric. This is engagement metric on steroids. I love this one. Click-through rate meaning means that if somebody opens the email, do they take action? And if they click the link, as Jordan said, his sales course had you know, the continuation of the article and potentially a video and a graphic on the website, if somebody reads the email and clicks the link, that defines uh, an engagement. And I love that. that is, this is a good metric. And again, it's easy to measure because no matter what email provider you will use, this is the KPI that they will provide to you readily and easy to, to find that. Um, Next thing to know for your business, and this is a bit more advanced, but I think it's not difficult, it's prospect to lead rate. Okay, just look at all your prospects, um, you know, that, that, are, that are on your mailing list, that are uh, um, uh, part of your, the downloaded ebook, and b figure out how many leads you have, and then that, that you get your prospect to lead rate or ratio. Uh, next one is the meeting rate. Same thing, from those leads, what is the percentage of people that go all the way down to the meeting? And finally, a conversion rate. You know, you get from, and so you'll be able to measure top down, right? You know, from, from the email list to the sales inquiry to the meeting to the close. What is the um, conversion rate that go, that, that was somebody that inquires for your business all the way down to close, what is your conversion rate? And, and Jordan, what is a good conversion rate and you run, you know, you run software, CRM software for hundreds of property managers out there. You know, why don't I put you on the spot here and you tell me what the average conversion rate is, you think? Uh, average conversion rate within the industry from lead to close is 13%. Okay. 13%. Very revealing. Okay. Let me talk about this and I'll circle back to the 13% uh, number. So... As I said, we went on a data dig and we found a few very fascinated pieces of information, which I kind of, again, I had a gut uh, reaction to them and it was positive and I knew some of it. But there's one thing that we found is that the open rate for our prospects that become customers is average at 44%. So in other words, I can look at my email list and see whose open rate is 44% and above. And I can conf confidently say that these people will become my customers at some point. Um, another thing, the click-through ratio for people on our mailing list, subscribers who become customers, average out 14%. So these people are very engaged. And 14% high number. It's a very good number for click-through ratio. In other words, this is when somebody they actually click and watch the video or click Click and, and go to the website or engage with that email uh, by clicking on some link on that email. Now, let's get a little bit into more interesting stuff. Okay. So, this is the average number of days it takes to go from a first contact to a signed contract for four and a half customers and prospects. 318 days on average. So, the first contact can happen in three ways. Either we do a cold reach out. So some, some, one of our sales team sends an email to a property management company that says, Hey, you know, have you, uh, uh, you know, how's your reputation doing? Have you started, you know, gaining reviews? Here's some, uh, books or here's a guide on how to uh, improve your reputation. It could be somebody we meet at the conference. We shake their hand and we introduce ourselves and 
uh, or it could be someone who called us and they're still in research stage. They're just not ready to buy four and a half services yet. They, you know, they're not there yet. But 318 days it takes on average from someone to first meet four and a half to do a work with us. Okay. It takes 221 days to go from an email list opt-in to sign contract. So we're now going. So there, there's a bit of a few months between the time you first met four and a half to the time you go on a mailing list. And from there, it takes 221 days to a to, to, to trust us. And it all boils down to this. On average, it takes 31 weekly educational emails for someone to become a customer of four and a half. Okay. So what that means is for seven months and three weeks, I am putting content, top-notch educational content that has no me in it whatsoever. No we, no me. It's all about how to run a property management business more effectively, more efficiently, how to how to grow and the old that, that kind of stuff. People who read our blog, they know that you know it's all about quality. Um, and there's no me in that blog. So 31. So if I was in the business for seven months and I was cranking out those emails on a weekly basis, I was putting a lot of effort in those emails, I would get zero phone calls. I would get zero customers until week 31. Right? Week 31 is where I begin to convert my readers into customers. And that's wow. average. Right. Wow. That's average. That's absolutely uh, amazing. This is so cool that you've been able to pull this information uh, together. So obviously, because it's an average, some people will convert sooner. Some people will convert much later. But 30, I mean, the, the, at, at the end of the day, 31 weeks of effort and patience. That's amazing. And I got to ask you, Alex, talking about the learning curve here, how long did it take you from when you started your business to you figuring out that you needed to do consistent content creation? And how did you feel early on in that first window when, okay, you decided to commit to it, but it was like week after week after week with no actual results? Like, just, just talk to me about just kind of like where, where, how you managed your, your mental state to actually get to the point of, of reaping this harvest early on. Yeah. No, that's a, that's a very good question. And the answer is very simple. I started the content and education before I started this business. Wow. Day one, day zero. D day minus, uh, minus six months because <laughs> I was still part of our folio. I was doing a lot of NARPUM talks on this subject of social media and marketing just because, you know, our folio wanted to give, give back to the property management community. So we wanted to educate on things not related to software. And I was the guy doing doing a lot of talks on these marketing stuff. And people ask me questions. I'm like, okay, I answer the same questions every time. Why don't I start a blog? So I started a blog and that's where it snowballed, right? This is, you know, it's it's at first it was very quiet. Very quiet. Nobody cared about my videos. Nobody cared about my blogs. There were there were I I I admit I look at my content way back. It wasn't that great, but it was pretty good given the fact there was nothing available back then. Five years ago, zero information on how to grow your company. Absolutely zero, nothing. So from that zero, what I had was something, right? And then from there, um, you know, I decided to form a company with five customers already committed and ready to go. I didn't just say, okay, well, pie in the sky, let's do property management marketing because you know it's it's a thing. No. It's the customers were already at my door saying, okay, can you do this for us? You seem to be the guy that knows. And maybe some of these customers are on this, uh, first five customers are on this webinar. Maybe then identify yourself if you are, but if you're not, that's okay. You're doing well. I, I, you know, I don't, you know, I don't blame you for not attending, but yes, start as early as you can, you know, get through that initial quiet zone or the desert, you know, the desert of content, you know, got to walk that desert like Moses, right? You got to take your people through it. And then at the end of the de desert, there's a, you know, two, three, four million dollar business waiting for you. Well said. Very well said. So next is, you know, we figured out what is our conversion between the nurtured emails into the sales inquiry. So, you know, we know it takes 31 emails to gain somebody's trust. And my business is very similar to property management business. I actually model a lot of the operations um, to my customers' operations, you know, account manager, property manager, assistant account manager, assistant property manager. We work on teams. Same thing. The, the perception and trust factor is very similar. 
because investors don't trust. So it's very hard for them to trust the property manager, somebody else with the property. Okay. So for us as a marketing company, it's very hard for us to earn the trust of our customers because it's just, it's, it's, you know, let's just face it. It's not very, you know, um, upstanding industry, so to speak. And it's very easy to mislead business owners, small business owners, especially with a lot of, you know, interesting offers and not showing anything at the end of the day. And it's very expensive. And let's just face it, Jordan, how easy do you think it is to con convince somebody to spend 10,000 to make a hundred thousand? Right. Yeah. It's, it's, it sounds good, but it's the 10,000 you need to spend <laughs> and see results in the future. Not right this second, right? I'd rather buy a lead for like five times as much right now and get immediate satisfaction. So anyway, long story short, nurturing emails to the sales inquiry is 12.3%. Now I'm going to drop this next slide like a, um, well, let's just drop it. Okay. So, but our conversion, our customer conversion rate, Okay. And we talked about the industry. What was the industry average again? 13, 13%. 13%. Okay. Because I've done the work and I've invested in educating my customers all the way to the time where they said, okay, I'm ready. I'm not cold calling people. I'm not bothering people. I'm not, you know, making them buy our services. They come to me after 31 emails, very well prepared to do the work. And my pricing is out there published. And there's a lot of different things. I have hundreds of positive reviews. 72% is our closing ratio. And that is no joke. That is a factual number. So we close 72% of prospects uh, once they raise their hand and say, okay, I'm uh, ready to talk to you in terms of uh, wow. helping the property business grow. Right. And wow. I tweet my own horn. That's fine. But I, this is the real data that I pulled that I, you know, I, it, in, in my gut, I thought, okay, we're pretty good. We're pretty good. Once we get an inquiry, we usually work it and finish it and, and close it and work with that person for a long time. But that's real number. So that's good. Um, yeah, that, that, that number, I'll just camping out on that for a second. That number is insanely high. And so this relates to what we, what we would call sales acceleration. Sales acceleration basically refers to the art of saying, typically our sales cycle is whatever three weeks, three months, three years, whatever it may be. We want people to go through that process quicker because we want to land more deals. We want to support our salespeople and we want to capture more revenue quicker. So with sales acceleration, all of this lead nurturing stuff directly applies to that. And I just, that, that number is so, 72%, that number is so high. We run into a lot of property managers that I say, oh, I close 100% of my leads or I close 80% of my leads. What those folks are actually talking about is they're saying of the highly motivated warm referrals that are sitting in my office with a contract in front of them, you know, 80% or some really high number actually sign. That 13% number is saying of all the people that fill out contact forms on your website, of all the people that call you and inquire, 13% actually close. Most people resist that number, but that is the actual industry average. So even though it's it's not the same thing because that industry number is for property managers and you guys are a marketing company, 72% is still insanely high. I'm, I'm blown away. I'm not, seeing that number, I'm even more motivated to keep investing in content and lead nurturing, just seeing how that pushes your close rate up overall. It The space the space of property management and investment real estate, you know, is aching for thought leaders, you know, because it's such a location-based business. You cannot be the, you know, uh, the, the guru that knows it all and get all the business out there. You have to be your know, boots on the ground, thought leader, you know, and it's not hard to do. And it is very easy to duplicate the success. You just got to commit to content. It is the magic. It works. I keep, you know, this is the, the lifeblood of our business and the lifeblood of our customer businesses. This content that you're, you know, you're so, um, you know, it, you, work, you work so hard to put together will define your company's growth and future for years to come. No doubt about that. Here's the proof. Uh, and believe me, it's not easy to sell $10,000 product to make somebody $100,000. It's not easy to sell property management to an investor who's concerned about the quality uh, and how their home is going to be handled. So we're in a similar position. It's a complex service. It's a it's a complex, you know, it's a trust-based 
uh, an experience-based kind of a buy. So uh, invest in content. That's all I can say. Let's keep going. Um, the average return on investment um, for email marketing, according to Direct Marketing Association, is 4,300, which is 4,300%, which is like massive, right? This is like numbers like, is that really true? So I did my own. I did my own, and and I actually factored in the labor, the copywriting costs. I factored in the cost of the platform. I factored in the cost, um, every cost related to us producing emails, okay? And according to my numbers, it's we returned 5,700% on a dollar invested in email marketing. <laughs> that is an, an unbelievable number. Uh, and and that when I saw the forty three hundred dollar number, I thought that was just a bunch of smoke. Uh, it can't be right. And then I did my own numbers on our own data dig yesterday, and this is this is the real thing. So it is possible. It is out there, and I encourage everybody to pay attention to lead nurturing and content as as you know future of your business. Um, one common mistake we find is, you know. We try to use metrics to justify our gut decisions. And sometimes it's okay as a small business owner, but you have responsibility to your employees. You have responsibility to, you know, your family to, um, you know, uh, to use data to make decisions. And it's not that hard to do. And when you do have lead nurturing program, you can iterate. As I said, you can start really small and then iterate, get better and better and better and better. And the fact that very few people do it, is the opportunity, window of opportunity, I think, at this point. Totally agree with you there, Alex. So guys, as we mentioned, this is part two. Part three is coming up. In part three, we're gonna be talking about the what. So we are progressively peeling this onion, going from the why, going from the how, and next talking about the what. And the what is basically the specific examples, the specific scripts, the specific copy, the specific topics, timing, sequencing, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, that you need to be able to build out a lead nurturing program. On that webinar, we're gonna have Dee Alamong who has a ton of experience with marketing automation uh, and a number of years in the property management industry. So I am super excited about that. Now, at this point, I want to mention um, that we are going to be taking Q&A at the end of this webinar. So if you have questions, guys, down below at the very bottom, you can ask a, uh, so you can submit a question and we will be answering those during the Q&A section. I see there, there are a couple of questions in there already. Go ahead and drop some more in. Um, before we get to that, though, I just want to Alex, I want to give you some um, airtime here to just tell us briefly about how Four and Half specifically helps their clients with everything we've been talking about, lead nurturing, et cetera. Yeah. So very simply, our challenge is to grow a property management business, grow a small business for start. We pick property management because we know everything about it. We want to learn everything about it. We want to continue educating ourselves on the industry and be the experts that we need to be to to really make the dent in the growth of a, of a business. But the challenge really is, you know, getting leads is 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 a kind of a well, pretty well defined process. We still define it and refine it, but it's pretty much proven and we can get it done. The next thing is helping close leads and you know putting more getting more value out of the leads people already get. And that is where lead nurturing comes in. So the challenge was how do you do it on a small business scale? at a small business budget with enterprise level kind of uh, uh, segmentation and enterprise level level you know delivery and specific content to go to specific people at specific stages so we found lead simple partner with lead simple and we have a uh, a package now a lead nurturing package that comes with lead simple membership or you know their CRM tool and that has all the email automation included under 300 bucks a month, at least at this stage. That's what that is. So we feel it's very, very affordable. And it's it's probably going to be one of the pillars of your growth and our service for years and years to come. So very excited about that. And uh, what's the next? Uh, Jordan, you want to talk a little bit about what you do? Because I think it's quite relevant here. 
Yeah, I do. Um, and so, guys, I just want to explain why we work together. Ale you may have noticed that Alex and I do a lot of work together. I like Alex. Nice guy. Friendly. He can crack a good joke. But more importantly than that, <laughs> there's a very logical reason that Alex and I work together. Alex's business for many years has been centered around helping you generate results, leads, marketing, impression, eyeballs, and that is fundamental. But the other thing that's fundamental is being able to take those marketing results and convert them into signed contracts, people that sign on the dotted line. That is how you get paid. And that is Lead Symbol's explicit focus is helping you close those leads that you get tighten your sales process to make sure you can justify your marketing spend. So that's why we work together. It's marriage made in heaven. We offer CRM software that helps you respond faster to new leads to track your track you, the marketing performance of each of your marketing uh, campaigns to track your salesperson follow-up. So calls, emails, all that stuff that you know you need to be taking notes on, but you don't have time to do, we pull it in automagically and store it for you. So you have great records and note keeping. And lastly, we do help enable workflow automation and drip campaigns. And the section of, or the portion of that that you can do inside of Lead Symbol is those transactional emails. So you already probably have some templates or you make your own templates by copying and pasting emails that you've sent out previously and using and recycling them again. We basically help you do that on steroids with thinking about the timing, with, with thinking about the stage specific coordination, et cetera, as well as coordinating the entire thing with the types of marketing emails that are more graphical that obviously weren't written by a person, et cetera, that could be sent out from somewhere like MailChimp, et cetera. So we wrap it all up in one. Check it out at leadsimple.com. Next thing you can also check out is the Lead Simple Sales course, which is the next slide. If you want to check that out, you can go to leadsimple.com forward slash sales dash course. Great information. Check it out. What Let's it's not going to do, it's not going to hurt you. <laughs> there you go. Well, <laughs> well, well said. So let's go ahead and take it back to the video here. And let's jump in to do some Q&A here. I see we have a couple of questions that came through here. Alex, you probably see these as well. I have seeded it with just a question that I had. So which is how long is it going to take the lead nurturing program to start working for my business? Because Alex, I know people saw that. They saw the stat on 31 emails and that's kind of like, Ew, so I'm going to sign up for this and it's going to be 31 weeks before I'm actually going to get some ROI on that. That, that can be a little bit of a scary proposition. Um, Alex, what's the answer? Is this, is this going to take like a year? If somebody start, start, signs up and starts using lead nurturing, is it going to take a year before they're going to see any ROI? All right, looks like Alex dropped off. So I'm going to go and answer that question myself here. The answer is that a lead nurturing program will work from day one. That early work that you're doing of sending out those value added emails will start working as soon as they get sent. Now, taking for somebody to the point of harvest where you have sufficiently answered all of their questions, you've motivated them, you've given them time to think, process, and self qualify, raise their hand, at which point they email you or call you. That is what takes the full cycle time of however many weeks it may be for your business. But lead nurturing starts working from day one. And the beauty about it is, is that this is how you build a long-term asset, a database. Alex, true or false, is it not massively important? And do you not place massive value on that email list that you have? If somebody was thinking about buying four and a half, purchasing your, your business, one of the things that they would be placing massive value on, on is your audience. And so for those of you that have leads come in, you're buying leads from APM, you're getting some leads from AdWords, wherever, but you're not actually nurturing them. And it's very, it's kind of a churn and burn thing. Somebody converts and if they don't, they're never going to hear from you again. If you're not building that long-term asset, you are missing out on a huge, accretive, growing asset for your business in the long term. True or false? Uh, true. Okay. The man doesn't lie. The man doesn't lie. All right. The well, other. Well, so, so one thing is, and, and it's also, you know, eventually you'll be able to get metrics like what we've gotten here uh, on a day to dig yesterday. And if anytime you have investors or people interested, uh, you know, or, you know, uh, you know, when you're ready to exit your business, you know, 
when you can actually show the potential buyer that here are my metrics for the last year and a half or you know a defined period of time we can convert that many we acquire that many you know subscribers here's my funnel now you will redefine the what it means to value and 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 put a price on you know high really high price on a property management business because you just you're going to have um you know an outstanding asset that is predictable and whoever the your your, your investor is or the buy, the person who buys your your business will will be able to put value on that and you get a better price absolutely absolutely next question is what is the same number for the PM industry? Is that 13%? So Bradley is basically asking that 13% number. What that is, is that is the conversion rate specifically for property managers of lead to close. That'll be higher or lower depending on your specific process. I can tell you that the um, paper lead providers tend to be a little bit lower. That doesn't mean that the paper lead providers are bad. That's just a reflection of the fact that they're really competitive because leads are being resold. And so if you're really aggressive and you're a stone cold closer, that could be a great fit for you. But you got to be mindful of asking yourself, what am I doing to maximally raise my conversion rate? Because your conversion rate directly relates to the marketing channels that are available to you. Because if you can't convert, you can't afford to buy leads. So... You know, to, to just riff on that real quick, if you start all the way at the recognition stage, research and evaluation of the sales process of, excuse me, of the buyer's journey and not at the purchase, you know, your conversion rate will be, you know, in the 50s rather than in the, you know, low teens and uh, uh, high teens. A lot of our customers we found convert at about 25 to sometimes even 33 percent. So that is that is what we see, at least on some of the more less competitive channels like Google AdWords and, and direct leads and stuff like that. I think 13% is, is a combination of buying competitive leads as well as, you know, doing your own, any and all inquiries coming into the company. Is that correct, Jordan? Is that what the 13% is all about? Just overall overarching average? Exactly. Yeah. And it's kind of like what you said. I mean, somebody that's working with you, there's a little bit more self-qualification there. Um, those numbers still sound a little high to me, but there is some level of self-qualification. The person that actually signs up for doing, for working with four and a half, maybe a little bit more mindful of actually having a structured sales process. And then you are skewing the numbers because the lead nurturing program you offer actually helps people with their sales process. True. So I would expect it to be a little bit higher True. for you. But also don't forget, all of our customers have video blogs. All of them have educational blogs and we don't publish it until it's really educational. So I think they're able to insert them a little bit earlier in a buying journey, number one. And number two, even if this, this, this first contact comes at the point of purchase, there's a bit of research being done by by the person and if they got an email with some good video or how-to video that already differentiates that uh, our customer our property management company significantly from the competition who doesn't do any of that just has it just publishes a few things on their website and uh, nothing else so yeah they've already been warmed up exactly a little bit more warmed up correct yeah i can i can agree with that let's go next next question is there an email marketing software that works particularly well with lead nurturing. What's the word, Alex? Well, need to snuck that in. He really wants to know. Um, the word is, well, we've been using MailChimp and it's been really a good, it's been a good system, but we've been getting red flagged by our customers have been getting red flagged for really no, for no fault of their own. You know, the, the campaigns are legit. Everything looks good. Everything's clean. The open rates are great. No one subscribes. And still, Mailchimp flagged them for some reason. The algorithm caught them or something. I don't know what the deal is. We couldn't get the real answer. I went all the way up to the Mailchimp CEO to try to resolve this issue, and we were not able to get uh, any answer except, well, tough luck. So there you have it. Mailchimp used to be good, but right now uh, we're looking at a company called Get Drip. And I think Jordan, that was your recommendation. I appreciate that. These guys are pretty solid. We're looking at uh, campaign monitor. We're looking at a bunch of a uh, bunch of others, but they're all technically would work. They all yeah. do this very similar thing. Some are a bit easier to use. I would I would look for ease of use probably uh, as my first criteria. Uh, and Mailchimp fits that criteria. Get Drip is even better. Getdrip.com, uh, and we might be converting our customers to that particular system uh, as we continue to kind of test them out. 
Okay, interesting. So my commentary on the MailChimp thing is that MailChimp just fundamentally has a um, a perspective that is not. It's it's a little bit more challenging to work with. They are very rigorous about um, permission, and they're just not as friendly towards certain industries. Real estate, property management kind of falls in the subset of real estate. Um, they tend to be real sticklers. And so they have been aggressively flagging based on certain things like saying, well, somebody filled out a contact us form. Does that mean you actually had permission to send them a follow-up email? Well, we would say, yeah, absolutely. If somebody filled out a contact sure. form to get information, obviously you should be able to send them relevant information about what you do. MailChimp's perspective, at least this automated algorithm is a little bit, is a little bit different. But as Alex said, there's a million tools that do the job. It's like asking, you know, what is the specific or best brand of tire iron? It doesn't really matter. Either you know how to use a tire iron or you don't. That, that's the real question. So um, all of these tools are good. There's a bunch of different choices out there. Let's go ahead and jump on to the next question. Uh, next question is from Cecilia Garrett. Who writes this content? Um, I don't know if you're talking about this content. If you're talking about the content in this webinar, that was us. We wrote that content ourselves. If you're asking about who writes the content for you, then that would either be yourself or a third-party provider. Like, for example, in case people are wondering, Alex, you guys actually create the content for your customers, correct? Yeah. yeah. So what we do, we, 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 we do the same thing we do, right? And that is, you know, once you have those video blogs that, that we provide or articles that we write for you, we convert them into a beautiful emails, right? That are super educational and relevant and blah, 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 all that good stuff. But yeah, so you already have the content. It just gets converted to the email uh, format and it gets dripped. You know, you got to dress it up a little bit, you know, understand that, you know, people are going to read it at one off situation. So you got to, you got to dress it up a little bit, but it's not a lot of work. Thing is, if you don't have any content whatsoever. Well, you got to start with content. Um, start with content, publish it on your blog. It's gonna give. It's gonna already get some legs and help you, you know, propagate in search and all that stuff, and insert yourself in the research step of the buying process. But also, you can re uh, repurpose it for the email marketing. So, get blog, start the blog, write the blog, hire a copywriter, you know, hire four and a half, do something, write yourself, go on video. Once you have the content, then you can recycle it. But the point is, you guys offer a done for you yep. solution. You're not saying you figure it out and then we'll repackage it. Like this is an end to end done for you solution. We actually have a prepackaged content that for people who don't have video blogs, you know, it's it's fairly, it, it's it, it's it just educates uh, you know real estate investors and and landlords on all the intricacies of property management. But we prefer to ship your own content rather than the stock content, which we also have. All right. Well said. Content is key. There's no doubt about it. All right. So next question is, can you give some information on a MailChimp? This is by Kelly Canaster. MailChimp is just a bulk email sending provider. So it's basically a tool that will allow you to collect an email list and send out an email to a bunch of people at once or to send out individual emails based on an automation sequence. These would be graphical emails with pictures, banners, Etc. It's a bulk email provider. There's a bunch of them. Mailchimp is a good one. Um, that's the that's the skinny on Mailchimp, Kelly. Next question from Bradley. After nearly two months of AdWords campaign with four and a half, we are now seeing a thirty to forty percent close rate on those that contacted us, and we haven't even started lead nurturing yet. Well, uh, da, Bradley. All right, man. I'm I'm impressed. Well, as I said, I, let me comment on this. First of all, Bradley, I you know thank you and bottom of my heart, but I really really, really glad to see those results. But remember, at the I, I, because I'm turning because I have this written on my wall, and that is you know during the purchase stage, as I mentioned. Even if you haven't inserted yourself or guided them through recognition, research, evaluation, even at the point of purchase, if you have the best sales process, you will likely have a very good chance to win. And that's uh, hats off to you. You probably not close them yourself or you have a great BDM that really pays attention. Nice work. Not bad. Not bad. Those are some really solid results, Bradley. Final question is from a need to... Seed who? Um, I haven't heard of this need to character. Yeah, he dropped four. <laughs> need to is asking, what can you do with the emails that you create for greater effectiveness? Well, need to? That's a really broad question. And my answer is 
Find out next time on part three of this three-part series on lead nurturing, where we're going to talk, going to be talking deep about the what, again, the exact copy, the timing, sequencing, frequency of how to actually build out a lead nurturing program. We've talked about the why. We've talked about the how. Next, we're going to go deep, 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 even deeper than we've already gone, because we've gone pretty deep already into the nitty gritty. So need to tune in next time and you will find out, my man. Wow, what a good setup. All right, so hey, that's what we had today. We've answered all of the questions, guys. Thank you so much for attending this webinar. We really appreciate you being here. Uh, We will send out the email about the next webinar, part three. Alex, thank you for joining me, my man. For those that are curious, when are they gonna get some more information? Because people are emailing, they're calling, they want information about the PM Grow Summit. Tell them now. Like the people are getting anxious. Like when are they going to get the info, Alex? First things, Jordan. You know, you did a lot of work for this webinar, and again, as I was preparing for it, I learned a lot. The data dig was pretty revealing for me, and I really appreciate you the work and the effort you put into this one. It's just it just shows the kind of person and the company you are. You know, it's not no Thank half you, measures. No half measures. Uh, but the PM Grow Summit is going to be the same. No half measures. And and Jordan will keep me honest. will keep me working hard. And that would be January 25th through 27th of 2017 in West Palm Beach. We're about to finalize the hotel. Next week is where we're shooting. I'm going to be in Hawaii next week working on this. In Hawaii on vacation, working on this with Jordan to get that email out to you and start selling tickets. 150 people. It's limited to that amount of people. We cannot accommodate anymore. We have some super duper keynote. The guy, just secret, secret, like that. The guy I've been following, the father of content marketing, the guy I've been following from day one, he is the reason I started this business and he's the reason we are where we are today. He is um, my hero and he's going to be probably speaking. Um, Jordan wouldn't let me share the name, but that's okay. Uh, he'll be probably <laughs> well, speaking. I'm, I'm excited, man. Yeah. It's, it's, it's a big one. I'm really, really excited. So, guys, that is the skinny. Um, if in between my ties, I can get Alex to draft the email with me, we're going to get out next week. We're super excited to give you those details. Thanks for attending. We'll see y'all soon. See you soon. Bye-bye.